Thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, we are here with the CEO of the GIPC, Yofi Grant, to talk about issues on investments, matters arising in the trade circles as well as FDIs and how far GIPC is going with regards to its work. Thank you so much for your time, Yofi. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your new appointment at the Organization of Africa, Caribbean and Pacific uh, States. Tell us really what role are you playing in this new uh, appointment that you were on? Now I want us to have a conversation on the Guta, uh, the foreign retailers, the issues that have come up. Uh, there's been a tussle between them. And with regards to the new GIPC Act 865, it is clear on foreigners not engaging in retail trade unless they are coming in with some $1 million. Now this has gone on for some time. Why are we still struggling to implement the law? Talking about the uh, GIPC Act 865, really what is the challenge here? Recognizing that we are in, as in the Committee of Nations, we are also an important player. We are a major signatory of other regional um, protocols. And uh, even without those regional protocols, like I've just said to you, we've had traders in and out of our markets for a long time. The problem starts when it becomes one of displacement. When a particular group come in and they displace your traders, either because they have competitive financing or they have ways and means of bringing their goods here to come and sell. And that, of course, I believe that every country has rules and regulations that forbid that. But I am not sure that um, our traders are saying they don't want any foreigners in our market. They don't want foreigners who come and displace them and outcompete them. And because they believe that as Ghanaians, they, I mean, this is, they have the right to overboard it. This is their right as, right. as nationals. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, you'd recognize the immediate difficulty because of what I've just told you about the homogeneity of the commerce along West Africa. So the issue of implementing that law up in issue was a problem because you have people from all West Africa in the market. Just like how you have Ghanaians in Togo, Ghanaians in Benin, Ghanaians in Nigeria, and Ghanaians in Cote d'Ivoire. And you need to find a balance to make sure that you don't upset that equilibrium or peace and stability that you have within the sub-region. And if, you, if your history uh, will be evoked, you remember in Buzia's time, even though we had this law, um, the, the efforts to implement the law requires more than just saying that nobody should come into a market because you are going to get reprisals, one. Secondly, I'm sure you yourself wouldn't want that uh, because you want the opportunity for Ghanaians to also go and trade and work in other countries and make money. And so it's, it's had a difficulty because there are security implications, there are commercial implications, there are regional migration pattern implications. Um, and, and, and you see that there are a lot more things involved than just saying, no, we don't want any foreigner in our market. So in the face of all these... So how far has the GIPC gone in relation to this tussle between the uh, Guta uh, as well as the foreign retailers. For Nigerians, they are, we call them our brothers. I mean, they've been in the market forever, mm -hmm. just like how Ghanaians have been there. And um, if, if I may um, aptly describe the situations, you know, the Nigerians are, are pretty aggressive about their business. And so given the least opportunity, they'll be where you are. And they are a lot too. And they are major traders. Um, and of course, we do have Ghanaians who are in the retail trade too, who have been trading for years. Um, and so when we have a sudden influx or surge in the numbers of people that we do not consider Ghanaian nationals coming to the market and displace our people, then it becomes a problem. And so far as there was a law crafted in the books, that was what the law was. So yes, the retailers would have every legitimate right to, to say that the law must be implemented because that's what the law says. I bet the framers in the law um, did think that um, you know it had to be put there. And, but, but implementing it to the letter was always going to be difficult because of reasons that I've given to you. But that didn't make it right that then anybody can just walk in and, and trade. Because in the law, in our law, it gives room to, if you want to go into retail trading, then you must demonstrate that you've invested a million dollars and you, the people who have come in to sell in the malls and the shops, etc., who have invested that one million people and probably employed more than 20 people. So they are not the ones breaking the law. The ones breaking the law are people who smuggle things inside, uh, smuggle fakes inside, and set up shops right in our markets, and outcompete our own people. 
That's where the problem is. And so you also have an immigration problem. Because then, per the ECOWAS protocols, you have right of access and way and goods um, uh, in trade. Um, and we have a common, we are trying to create like a common market in ECO, ECOWAS. Yeah. Uh, but the issue is, there are limits that you can't be there for more than, you can't stay for more than 90 days. And if you're coming in purposely to come and trade, then you have to get the necessary required visa or entry permit to come and trade. And that requires that then you have to comply with the law as Ghana has said it. And this, I, I guess it's the same in Nigeria or Togo or Cote d'Ivoire everywhere. In any case, this problem is not unique to Ghana. It's all over. It's in Burkina. It's in Cote d'Ivoire. I'm sure the conversation it, came up again after the latest uh, talk. difference is that we truly incentivize our retail people as Ghanaians. Because if you truly incentivize them um, and, and uh, beyond just a protection, you give them the opportunity to outcompete completely. I mean, if a Ghanaian is getting, uh, maybe he's getting a very low tax rate, he's getting uh, funding at very competitive and very attractive rates, and he's doing his trading, I don't know which foreigner will come and compete with him. I, I look at a, a place in the future where our traders will move just from the retail to the wholesale to the manufacturing. That is really where we want them to be. Uh, we are moving the economy away from the tabletops, you know, to one of productivity, um, such that our people will produce. And in the light of that, for example, we were actually organized, we actually organized a delegation from Guta to go to Mexico um, to meet the people who produce the spare parts because uh, Mexico is one of the biggest countries for spares, original equipment manufacturer spares for the U.S. market and even for Europe. And so in our minds, if we met, get them to meet with our Ghanaian retailers, they can form the partnerships that can then bring, first of all, well, we can bring the spare parts in from Mexico and um, away from some of the other more expensive markets, but then we can build the capacity size that we can either start assembling or manufacturing from Ghana in partnerships with some of the traders. And for me, that is a, a very progressive way to look at it. We want to migrate from just um, selling goods that are imported from elsewhere to producing those goods and selling here. I think that when we do that, we'll give uh, our retailers a, co a ma major, major lift and competitive edge. And they, nobody can come in and compete with them. But so far as the law stands, yes, the law needs to be uh, applied. And we will work at ensuring that we eliminate those challenges that we see. You make mention of the, uh, the movie industry, the film industry, for instance. I know that there's been some investors eyeing that industry. You raised questions. You had problems with it, even though uh, they are eyeing this particular industry. What new strategies are you adopting for GIPC? And for instance, the movie industry or the film industry, whether or not they are prepared, looking mm -hmm. at some of the issues or problems you mm -hmm. brought out. So yes. how far... Has the conversation gone? Well, well, for us as an institution that is, is um, set up to solicit, attract, market Ghana and, and investments into Ghana for economic growth, um, there are priorities. But of course, I mean, with COVID, every, almost everything suddenly became a priority. And film particularly is one of those soft industries that people do not see the direct impact on the bigger economy. But film, arts, and culture are very significant. If you look at the American economy and the, the impact of film and music and sports, it tells you that you can't just leave those things out when you're thinking of your strategy calls. But also, how do we maintain livelihoods? So you start to think, OK, so right now, we can't do that. If you build film studios in Accra today, you can't have people go to cinemas because there's still the fear. Of, con of contact, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But you are looking at the future. How can you reposition that as a major attractor of capital? And I think Ghana has a very good opportunity and position for that. In the past, Ghana had a very active film um, industry. And out of that, we saw some of the moves, like I told you so, and all these things. As kids, today, you hardly find any movie, family movie that um, Ghanaians can go and watch because it almost all but collapsed. But there are significant efforts, which means that the industry itself needs to start growing again. We may not have all it takes to make it a vibrant one immediately, 
But going forward, you need to do that. What is the vision of government when it comes to the automotive industry? Well, first of all, is to set up an automotive industry hub in Ghana, first for the sub-region, and then create the necessary infrastructure to make sure that you build a vibrant transport industry. First and foremost, you have to move things. And prior to, we, I mean, I, I should say 99 point, maybe 8% of the cars in Ghana are imported. Do you know the cost that second-hand cars and parts poses on the economy? A significant cost. But you know, it's interesting that you should come from this angle because this same problem was faced by South Africa many years back, where people say, well, no, 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 you're going to spoil people's jobs and bring in second-hand clothes and cars. First of all, who wouldn't want to drive a new car anyway? Why should we settle for second-hand when we can have a new car? Assembled in our own country. I mean, I, I wouldn't understand that argument. But the people think it is going to put them out of business. So you find another business that is in the same industry that will make you even have more value. If you are selling new cars, wouldn't you get better value than selling second-hand cars? We, you and I, you and I are here in Ghana. We ri drive by the roadside. You see cars parked by the roadside, months and months. They are there. But you can go and inquire from Toyota, from Peugeot, from Rindo, from Zvani. People are now buying new cars because they find that it's better for them. It's more economical. It saves you a lot. Um, it's healthier. Um, because you don't have them with bad engines spewing out a lot of garbage into the atmosphere, you know. And so, but I do understand that usually people come up with, wow, I can't afford a new car yet. But when you start to assemble cars here, you are going to get to a point where the pricing won't be like an import. How many people can afford? Do you know how many people are buying cars off the markets at higher than 60,000? No, I'm talking to the, I'm talking about the people. You said these You are saying how many can afford. Yes, you say how many people can afford to buy a car at 69,000. And I say a lot of the second hand cars you see on the on the roads are more than 69,000 cities. So after VW, which other ones should we expect? Oh, there are quite a number of them in there. Um, uh, Renault is looking at coming in. Suzuki is coming in. Um, there's already Sino truck that is assembling trucks um, for the market from China. Um, Honda, we are in discussions with Honda. Then there's Toyota and Nissan also looking to assemble here because they believe that it's easier and the barriers to uh, creating the business here are much lower. If we have that critical mass of assembling here, and we, we also have our own local, you know, um, Kantanka. If we are able to create a critical mass of production here, trust me, a lot of the cars that you see on the roads will be replaced anyway because nobody's going to buy a second hand car. They'll prefer a, a, a brand new car. Now let's look at the successes you have chalked for GIPC so far for your administration. From beginning till now, uh, you just have some few months to end the year. How has it been for you? Yes, you've seen increased numbers of foreign direct investment, as I told you yeah. before. And to the point that we are acknowledged as being the, the, the most attractive investment um, destination in West Africa. But in the period, because of the work we've done as Ghana, I mean, I was nominated to sit on the board of the World Association of Investment Promotion Agencies to represent Sub-Saharan Africa. Because some of the policies that we are rolling out in Ghana were seen to be the policies that is going to accelerate investment attraction and facilitation to the continent. So they thought that, well, yes, then let's pick the Ghana person who is pushing for these things. And they are there. And so for me, it's also a personal, um, um, should I say, victory for the country and the government to be able to get that there. I was also recently appointed to the um, Endowment Fund, Endowment and Trust Fund Board of the OACPS, which is a significant thing because then we can redirect resources and investments back to the continent. Now, to the main issue for discussion, talking about your investments, talking about the country's FDIs, um, looking at it from this angle, let's look at the rates. Before COVID, how has it been for you? And in this period, what has been the impact of COVID on your activities? We expect that maybe 80% of what we are looking at may not happen. But I'm not saying that yet because figures that I am seeing um, has a very interesting story. Can you share with me? The yes, of course. The first quarter of this year, um, total FDI was somewhere in the region of 180 million. 
it was much higher than it was in 2019. Strangely enough, the second quarter has registered even higher FDI, although we expected that there would be a significant drop. And the month of June, which is like the time when most countries are tapering off their restrictions and opening up, we saw a sudden surge. Because the world is opening up, people need to take advantage of opportunities quickly. The world needs to recalibrate. The world needs to reset and restart. And we are not going to kill over and die because of the disease. We need to live. We need to get industry back. We need to get people working back. Prior to COVID, we had a number of significant transactions that we expected to take. And um, when you put them all together, the total investment would have ex exceeded $10 billion. So for me, I always say, look, you should aim for that $10 billion figure. You might not get it, but you might get half of it or three quarters of it. That is absolutely way more than you'd have gotten if you don't aim at all. Ghana is resource rich. If we form and find the right partnerships, because the world needs to get back into shape. China is looking to strengthen partnerships with Africa post-COVID. Uh, because uh, a lot of people think that multilateralism is dead and maybe the, the major replacement for that is bilateralism. But for us in Africa, we are still very multilateral with the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. And so we look for, but we look for, we are equal opportunity, uh, should I say partner. We look for partnerships all over the world. We don't, we only pick and choose when it makes sense mutually, not when it favors one side. So things like that are very good. Then of course agriculture, because we've got to eat. And um, God has blessed us with quite a lot of good arable land. But we need to develop it just not only to eat, but to also to create um, a durable and sustainable substrate for industry through food processing. And so that is also one of the strategies that's going to be adopted to elevating agriculture. Finally, okay, um, when you're not talking on webinars or you're not talking investments and FDS, what do you do at your free time? <laughs> Post COVID, you're not, you're not having this conversation. I'm thinking about the next conversation. <laughs> you're thinking about the next conversation. Yes. So there's no free time. There's That's free my time. my. For me, freedom is able to think and come out with solutions. That's freedom. If if you 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 think you can't come out with solutions, you are imprisoned in your own mind. You should be able to think out new things and be aggressive and creative, and always believe that. What you did yesterday was not good enough. What you should do tomorrow should be better. You want me to believe your, your, your world is about work, 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 work. Well, even when <laughs> I, I, I am... What, what would I consider as leisure, though? It's, and you've asked me a very deep question. <laughs> I, 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 I love sports. I love art. And as you can see, I'm in photography. So you see pictures and a lot of art in my room here. Um, I love culture. Uh, them yourself. Yes, these are all pictures I took. Um, you'd be surprised. One of my pet, my pet um, ambitions is to catalog Ghanaian cultural dances. I mean, when I when I watch people dance at Doha in its different forms, the rhythm and the coordination is another language altogether. Okay. It's been exciting having this conversation with you. We are so grateful for your time. Right. So we have a conversation with the CEO of a GIPC, Yofi Grant, talking about issues on investment, talking about FDIs, and current matters arising right here. Thank you so much. My name is Nana Ikuya Mensah Brampa with TV3.